Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Sustainable Buildings Canada uh, product webinar series. Um, we used to do these live in person. This is our first uh, virtual product knowledge uh, event um, and uh, we're very excited to, to kick this off. So um, here we go. There's a, a quick agenda here so you can see what's going to happen. R right now we're at the very top. This is me, Adam Jones from Sustainable Buildings Canada, welcoming you to our webinar. Um, and then we'll throw over to Mary Sai from Enverge Gas, our sponsor for this webinar series, and then Jordan Doria and Connor Jacquet, um and Graham Coote will uh, discuss some, some uh, sustainable technologies uh, before we wrap at noon. I want you to note that in the webinar controls, you will see a button to ask a question. Type a question anytime you have a question throughout the webinar, type it in there and we will read it to the presenters at the end. You can also raise your hand. There's a little button on the hand. You can raise your hand during the question period if you'd like to have your microphone open to ask the question directly. We have a few upcoming events at Sustainable Buildings Canada. You can always check out what we're doing at sbcanada.org or follow us on Twitter at S. Sust building can. That's a very uh, good short form to write, not so much to say. Um, our Green Building Festival topic for this year has been launched recently, and uh, that is shockproof your project. Uh, we recently went through quite a shock, still going through a shock, I suppose. If you look at that, uh, that waveform, we're sort of uh, hopefully toward the middle to end after that big uh, spike. Um, hopefully we're coming back to some sense of normalcy soon as vaccines roll out. But um, this, the topic for this year's festival is how to um, make your buildings more resilient, all of your projects uh, more resilient and shockproof. So check that out at gbf21.com. In the, the next product knowledge webinar in the series um, is now uh, available for registrations. Uh, the topics um, are the new Mitsubishi um, air to water heat pump and the Mitrex building integrated uh, photovoltaics system. Uh, both of these products have been generating a lot of interest from uh, everyone in the Sustainable Buildings Canada world. Um, and so we're happy to, to bring uh, these two topics to you. You can register for those at this. Uh, URL there, we did it tiny.cc slash sbcpkmay. Um, the trick here is that it is case sensitive. So when you type that into your, your address bar, make sure you do capitals all the way to the end and then the last two letters are lowercase. Now I'm gonna pass things over to Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas, who's going to introduce our presenters today. Mary? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, Enbridge is very pleased to be um, part of this um, uh, presentation. We um, sponsor Sustainable Buildings Canada. Um, my job at Enbridge is um, I am look after the conservation area for savings by design, which goes right across Ontario, as well as the municipal um, outreach. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Um, first, there's Jordan Doria. He's with Sage Glass. He's a territory manager for Eastern Canada. Jordan has 12 years in the building products industries, always with the eye towards carbon neutral technologies. Next, we have Connor Decay, is a geothermal designer with GE Optimize and lead author of the paper, Feasibility of Thermal Load Control from Electronic Windows for Ground Amped, Ground Coupled Heat Pump Optimization. That's a mouthful. <laughs> And then last but not least, we have Graeme Coote, who is part of the owner of the direct sales group at HTS Engineering, the local representative for Shark Energy Systems in Ontario. Graeme has over 10 years of experience in the HVAC industry, working as a mechanical engineer at the Toronto-based consulting firm, and more recently as a technical sales representative at HTS Engineering. So I'm looking forward to today's webinar. But before we um, move forward, um, Adam, if you could just share a quick video on what is um, happening with Enbridge. Thank you. Ontario is committed to a clean energy future. Enbridge Gas is doing its part with Innovative Renewable Natural Gas, or RNG. You may think of wind and solar energy as renewable, but food scraps, farm waste, and sewage can also provide carbon neutral energy. First, we collect waste into a digester tank. As it breaks down, we capture the methane released. 
Once the biogas is cleaned and upgraded, it's turned into RNG. It can then be added to the Enbridge gas system to heat homes and businesses, power factories, and fuel transportation, helping Ontario reduce greenhouse gas emissions and manage waste more effectively. RNG is fueling the future in the fight against climate change. Learn more at EnbridgeGas.com slash RNG. Okay, and with that, we'll give it over to Jordan and Connor. Well, thank you, Adam, and hello, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the sustainability benefits of smart window technology. Um, just a little bit of introduction on, uh, start with an introduction on Saint-Gobain, a uh, parent company of, of my organization, Sage Glass. Gonna talk a little bit about the facade design challenge that we have, that we all have, and how it relates to sustainability. Uh, a little bit of an overview, quick overview on how smart windows work, some of the wellness and sustainability impacts, a couple case studies, and then Connor is gonna do a deep dive on a really exciting case study a partnership between GeoOptimize and SageGlass. So just who we are, SageGlass is a business unit of Saint-Gobain. Saint-Gobain is one of the largest building products companies in the world, the number two producer of glass products globally. SageGlass has been the market leader in smart window technologies with over a thousand installations in 28 countries around the world. Um, we have a growing presence um, in, in Canada. You can see a few different reference projects we have here, both Eastern and Western Canada. So I want to spend time focused more on what are we talking about with the facade design challenge and what does that mean for a smart window system? So ultimately, when we are talking about a facade, um, we want to achieve a few different things. We want to deliver wellness, which is obviously is a lot of different parameters. But when we're talking about glass and glazing, we're really thinking about providing ample daylight and providing a view and connection to the outdoors. The, the wellness benefits of daylight and views are, are well known. But then with that, we also have wellness challenges, thermal comfort, visual comfort in the form of glare and how to balance those. We also want to deliver facades that are sustainable. And while I work for a large glass company, I still have to concede a basic point, which is that glass is a bit of an energy efficiency liability. So how do we uh, balance the need for wellness and sustainability? And then of course, the third parameter is cost. We wanna keep upfront costs down designers of buildings, developers want to preserve the design intent. They want the building to have the particular look that they're after, that they believe is marketable. And of course, we hopefully are, are paying attention not just to upfront costs, but to full life cycle costs and considering um, life cycle costs you know, in the context of carbon pricing as well. So really, these are the challenges that we have in the building industry that kind of come to a head with facade choices. But we have a problem with the status quo. Uh, the status quo solution would be a uh, regular sort of standard low E glass, double pane glass with manual blinds. This is essentially the default solution. And the problem with that is manual blinds tend to be down 50 to 70% of the time. Lots of different data sets on this. This is true around the world, different climate zones, different building types. Um, this is what you see. And, and we've all probably experienced it ourselves. You go by buildings on sunny days and the shades are down, those same buildings. Um, on a cloudy day, the day after, and the shades are in the exact same position, right? It's a manual solution and that's the results you get. But then back to the idea of glass being an energy efficiency liability, um, on average, an opaque curtain wall is eight times more energy efficient in terms of our value than a glazed curtain wall, right? So you, you have this uh, loss essentially of performance and then with blinds down, you're, you're really not reaping the benefit of daylight of that connection and view to the outdoors, which is really why we're putting windows into buildings in the first place. And so this is where we get into you know, smart windows and the problems they can solve. Um, traditional solutions essentially steal daylight and, and views and have a negative impact on occupant wellness. Uh, a term I can't take credit for, but I like, is that blinds turn windows into both expensive and energy inefficient walls. And, and fundamentally, when we think about the need for adaptive and resilient buildings, static facades, passive products put in our buildings simply are by nature not particularly adaptive or resilient, right? So um, we know needs are changing. We know the climate is changing. Um, so how are we going to future-proof buildings, not just to succeed and perform today, but to continue to do so in the future? And this is where uh, we believe smart windows can offer a solution on all fronts. So what exactly are we talking about with smart windows? Well, 
Uh, what makes the window smart is that it changes its visible light transmittance, the amount of light coming through the glass, which at the same time also modulates the amount of heat coming through the glass. Um, the analogy that's often used is sort of like your, your old transition lenses for, for those who've ever, uh, ever worn them. But instead of just reacting to light, it's actually controlled electronically. And so every project um, is really an automated tinting solution from a model-based predictive algorithm that also uses real-time weather data to tell the glass across the building exactly what to do to be clear, lightly tinted, medium tinted, or very tinted to both maximize daylight, control glare, and manage heat gains, um, which is obviously where the energy performance benefits come into play. Um, when it's fully tinted, it can block much more solar radiation um, than traditional, uh, even triple silver or, or triple low E uh, glazing solutions can. This automated solution always comes with different forms of manual control. That can be a simple wall-mounted touch panel, essentially a thermostat for your glass, uh, app-based control from your own personal mobile device or even voice command, as well as integration into building automation systems. And this is something that Connor will talk about uh, in the context of the project that, that we've collaborated on. So obviously in the, the vein that a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, for something like our solution, a, a video is worth even more. So you can see here what we're talking about. And here you can actually see the sophistication of the glass where just a portion of it uh, can go from clear to tinted to block heat and glare while still maximizing daylight in the space. And that same solution can also tint bottom up if you have reflected glare, for example, from, from snow or bodies of water. Um, and that same unit can have the glass fully tinted, which is sort of where the technology started. So it's a highly versatile solution to, again, balance these different goals we have from a facade standpoint. So I want to drill down a bit on the data specific to um, some of the sustainability benefits. So this is based on work that um, RDH Building Science did um, that we commissioned them to do last year. Uh, and we really wanted to look at a couple different things. We wanted to look at dynamic glass in the context of the Toronto Green Standard, BC Energy Step Code, um, as well as uh, passive house targets. And we wanted to understand not just how they meet today's targets, but to meet more ambitious out year targets. And so what you can see here is a model building um, built with dynamic glass meeting. In this case, we're looking specifically at the total energy use intensity or the two E threshold for a TGS tier three building. Um, so then the ask of them was, okay, build a compliant building with dynamic glass. Now take out dynamic glass and put in a, a common conventional glazing solution and look at the delta in compliance. And that's essentially what you have here. You have a project, a building that is not meeting the two-week performance target. And then for RDH to use their expertise as, as consultants, as facade consultants, envelope consultants, to make recommendations on if you weren't to use dynamic glass, what other mechanisms would need to be used to get that building back down to that compliance level. Um, that would be deemed you know, readily available and cost effective. And really what they found is um, if you were to remove dynamic glass, your only option is to actually dramatically reduce your window wall ratio here going from 50% down to 25%, which is far lower than is normal, um, and still add fixed shading to all, uh, all glazed areas. And you actually saw the, the same thing come out when we looked at passive house targets. It was a, a, the targets are different, of course, but a fairly similar story. And I'm going to go through these relatively briefly in the interest of time, but we have a whole white paper that really goes into this in detail. Um, and it, the same story played out again when we looked at uh, the BC Energy Step Code uh, for a building, an office building in Vancouver. Kind of the same story. Um, you needed to, in this case for, for passive house, you needed to either dramatically improve your HRV efficiency or again, lower the window wall ratio. And the, that reduction is even more dramatic when we were looking at uh, BC energy step code. And so what this is really kind of getting at here is um, we want future buildings to both be sustainable and still have that focus on wellness. We, we put glazing in for a reason, but the, the challenge is going to be how do you still deliver a building that provides adequate uh, glazing while meeting these future targets. And you can see that there's gonna be a number of different uh, uh, trade-offs that, that designers and developers will need to analyze. And so we think that um, smart windows provide that better balance. You can still preserve the amount of glass you want to use for the wellness benefits, the marketability benefits, um, 
but then also um, you know, meet these more ambitious targets. Another important point is uh, the ability to dynamically reduce uh, uh, solar gains in particular in the summer months has significant impacts on peak cooling loads. Um, and you can see here what the, the different impacts were for the building archetypes um, that, that RDH analyzed. Um, and really across the board, you're seeing from a percentage standpoint, significant reductions in peak cooling demand. And um, when done correctly and, and in consultation with a project mechanical engineer, this can and should re uh, result in a, a system downsizing, a cooling system downsizing, which provides some, some CapEx savings. I'm going to touch on a couple uh, case studies before handing uh, things over to Connor. Um, one passive house project that, that we supported, uh, Vancouver's Fire Hall 17, uh, nearing completion, I believe, right now, see a dramatic reduction in operational carbon. Um, was this particular project using triple pane dynamic glass. And, and what's interesting is, um, obviously, passive house is a very ambitious target. Um, and we provide a sort of uh, what we call a tint schedule, how the glass is going to perform in that building for the year as an input to the passive house um, modeling software. And our sort of standard approach, we thought tweak to help them get to that passive house target. So we're able to really play with that control algorithm and the different parameters to, in this case, actually improve passive heating in the winter months. So essentially to tint a little bit less often than we normally would to help meet that target. And that's when we talk about the importance of an adaptive facade. It gives you a new a tool really as, as a designer and as a building operator to optimize performance. And we've also done this for projects that are more cooling sensitive than heating sensitive as well. Um, another project, uh, a net zero uh, renovation uh, for a project in, in Washington, D.C. You can see here the significant uh, heat gain reduction benefits associated with the use of dynamic glass, as well as some lighting reduction benefits compared to manual shades. Um, but interestingly, in a, even in a hot, humid climate like Washington, D.C., combination of dynamic glass, a well-insulated facade, um, allow them to move away from, from traditional forced air cooling, which is, of course, the, the norm, and to instead use chilled beams, which is uh, somewhat uncommon in a, in a hotter, humid climate in an office uh, condition like this. Um, so it really shows kind of the different synergies that are available when you take a more holistic approach to design and look at dynamic glass along with other high performance measures. And as Graham will be talking about this project, uh, not, he won't be talking about this project, but wastewater heat exchange was also used here as well. So a lot of really interesting and innovative uh, features were incorporated to help, um, you know, help this building meet its targets. So I am now going to um, give control to, uh, to Connor and let him take over. Okay, thanks, Jordan. Um, let me know when I have control, and I'll start uh, yapping away. I think you should be able to advance. Okay, yeah, seems to be working. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jordan. Uh, my name is Connor Dacway, and I work for a company called Geoptimize. Uh, Geoptimize is a consulting firm uh, that focuses on commercial ground source heat pump systems. And before I get into a specific uh, case study, I'd like to go over just the basics of a, of a ground source heat pump system. So uh, ground source heat pump systems work by the, the constant temperature differential between the outdoor air and the ground temperature and by leveraging the refrigeration cycle. So ground source heat pump systems are comprised of heat pumps and ground heat exchangers. Heat exchange fluid is circulated through the ground heat exchanger and transferred, uh, and, and heat is transferred from the surrounding soil through conduction and convection. In the summertime, ground source heat pump systems can provide cooling to the building uh, since the ground temperature is cooler than the outside air. And likewise, in the wintertime, uh, the ground source heat pump system can provide heating uh, because the ground temperature is warmer than, than the outside air. And another really important piece to understand is that ground heat exchangers work more like batteries than conventional heating and cooling systems. So since the ground is not a very good conductor, uh, you must balance the amount of heat you inject into the ground versus extract. 
so keep that in mind uh, as I as I go through these slides. So for this specific project we were involved with, the existing building was 55,000 square feet of floor area, and the owner wanted to increase the floor area to 77,000 square feet. And they also wanted to increase the window to wall ratio to 30%. There was an existing ground heat exchanger for the original building uh, underneath a parking lot, and this was non-expandable due to land limitations. Uh, so since we couldn't increase the size of the ground heat exchanger, we looked at managing the building heating and cooling loads. And since the building was increasing the amount of windows substantially, we wanted to see how much the solar heat gains would affect the internal heating and cooling loads. And as Jordan alluded to previously, uh, Smart Glass has the ability to dynamically change the solar heat gain coefficient of the window, which can control the amount of heat entering the building from the sun. So the logic was that if we could control the tint of the windows, we could control the amount of heat rejected or extracted from the ground. So when the windows were clear, uh, the solar heat gains would enter the building, which would increase the cooling load, and this cooling load would inject heat into the ground. So the heat would, or the, the ground would warm up. And likewise, when the windows were fully tinted, the solar heat gains would be blocked, which would increase the heating load, and this would pull heat uh, from the ground which would therefore cool off the, the ground temperature. So what we did to test our logic was create a detailed uh, hourly building energy model of the anticipated building and simulated the model over a standard year of operation to see the amount of heating and cooling needed. We ran the building or we ran the building model four different times uh, while altering the, the solar heat gain coefficient of the windows. And when I say solar heat gain coefficient, that's this uh, acronym SHGC here. And so 0.41 means essentially clear glass. And as I lower, uh, as you lower the solar heat gain coefficient, the, the tint of the window increases. So as you can see, as we increase the tint of the window, the building cooling load decreases accordingly. And the model showed uh, that the annual cooling, the annual cooling load can be decreased by 32% uh, between the clear and fully tinted window states. So this, this was quite substantial. And so what this means on the, the ground source heat pump side of things is that we can prevent overheating of the system. So after we developed the building energy model, we simulated the temperature of the heat exchange fluid circulating through the ground heat exchanger going to the heat pumps over a 20 year period, which is your typical uh, lifespan of, of heat pumps. And since this building is what's called cooling dominant, uh, the temperature of the ground heat exchanger increases over time. So this line represents when the windows are at uh, fully clear state, so 0.41. Um, as we decrease the, the solar heat gain coefficient or increase the tint, uh, the, the time at which the heat pumps will overheat uh, decrease or increases uh, accordingly. So as we decrease the solar heat gain coefficient, uh, we went from uh, overheating at four years to overheating at seven years. Uh, we increase the tint more. The, the system will overheat around 15 years. And then finally, uh, at, at the solar heat gain coefficient of, of 0 0.09 or the fully tinted state, we can stay within the efficient operating range over the, the full 20-year uh, simulated period. So this line uh, right here, this 32 uh, degrees Celsius, is roughly the point at which heat pumps, uh, the efficiency starts to deteriorate, and eventually they'll fail due to high pressure uh, shutoffs. So in order to uh, dynamically control the smart glass based on the energy extracted and injected into the ground heat exchanger, we had to develop a hardware software package. And the hardware uh, was nothing novel, uh, it consisted of a typical energy meter that is installed on a ground heat exchanger. And an energy meter is essentially a, a flow meter and a temperature sensor on the inlet and outlet. So with the delta T and the flow, you can calculate the energy. Um, the energy meter is connected to a remote server uh, through Wi-Fi. And on this remote server, we can calculate the future temperature trends of the ground heat exchanger based on the measured flow uh, through the ground heat exchanger. 
So our remote server can connect to the building automation system to signal the smart glass to either darken or lighten the glass based on the trending ground heat exchanger temperature. So if we zoom out, uh, th this concept can be extrapolated to more technologies other than just smart glass. And by integrating uh, with auxiliary heating and cooling devices, uh, it allows for optimization of a ground source heat pump system and long-term reliability. So one of the, the biggest challenges and, and problems in the industry is the perception that ground source heat pump systems are not only expensive, but they don't work. And one of the things that all people uh, like about the, the ground source heat pump systems is that they can reduce energy consumption and CO2 emissions. But the truth is when they're designed properly and the whole building approach is considered, they can provide a low simple payback and very attractive ROIs or return on investments. And when I say the whole building approach, I mean working with the architect to see how different design decisions affect the overall heating and cooling load of the building. Also by adding uh, automated monitoring and management instrumentation on the ground heat exchanger, uh, this essentially guarantees reliability throughout the life of the system. So as the world transitions to more renewable energy resources, uh, ground source heat pump systems work hand in hand by not only electrifying the building, but lowering annual peak energy demand. And at 2% market penetration, uh, we believe that geothermal technology is the future and it's not a matter of if, but, but when. Um, so thank you for listening and I'll now pass it off to Graham to talk about wastewater heat recovery and I'll be sticking around until the end of the webinar to answer any questions. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Connor and Jordan. Um, we'll, we'll take a, a brief break here and we um, see if we have any questions. Um, we'll give the audience a chance to ask any questions of uh, you two first. Uh, we have one question, I'll start with that, um, from uh, Sophia. Uh, so about the Sage Glass electrochromic um, systems, how long has this technology been available in the market? And is it also available for residential homes? Yeah, um, the, the technology sort of been iterated on Sage Glass was founded uh, over 30 years ago. It's been commercially available really since 2005 and kind of only, I would say, entered the mainstream in really the last eight or nine years when capacity uh, from a production standpoint has allowed us to really play in, into the sort of larger project space. Um, but we now have that track record of, of supporting larger projects um, and uh, obviously then also a track record of proven performance in, in the field. Um, we don't really serve uh, residential or, or at least single family residential today. It do entirely to, there's nothing fundamentally about the technology that doesn't support it. It's really just about this fully automated, highly customized solution that we're delivering is better suited to uh, larger projects. Um, so single family homes, because of um, all the sort of work we do from, from a software uh, design support standpoint, uh, hasn't yet really translated. Um, we have done some larger multifamily uh, commercial, but single family is not where we're, uh, where we're playing today. Thank you for that uh, detailed answer. Um, so, uh, we have another question uh, that just came in. Um, what about bird-friendly design considerations? For example, you, uh, could you have automated fritting? Uh, it's an interesting question, automated fritting. Um, I'm not aware of anything that allows for sort of automated fritting. Um, and I, I'd say the main reason for that is, uh, and where the Toronto Green Standard is going, for, for those who don't know, bird-friendly requirements, those little dots you see on the glass, historically has been on surface two, which is essentially within the insulating glass unit itself. Starting next year, um, those bird-friendly markers, the, that frit, will need to be on surface one. So that is on the exterior of the glass. As you can imagine, the, the electrochromic coating, what causes our glass to tint, can't, can't be on the outside. It has to be essentially protected within that insulating glass unit. So that means some sort of automated fritting isn't really feasible. Um, would be desirable, but we haven't yet uh, found a way. So we, we uh, in the dynamic glass, smart window space are, are really doing the same things others are doing, which is um, sourcing glass um, that has that frit applied to it on surface on surface one. And then there are also some aftermarket solutions like a cast PVC um, that can be applied you know, in the field as well. 
Okay, thank you. All uh, right, now we have a question for Connor. Um, were you able to verify the results of the model? A 32% decrease in heat load is significant if it can be verified beyond simulation. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Since this building uh, was a, a, a renovation, uh, there was no energy bills to calibrate the energy model to. Uh, typically, if we're given a design on a, on a retrofit of an existing building, we'll, we'll calibrate the building energy model to uh, the energy bills uh, that the you know the building owners are paying, so we can we can quantify how much natural gas they're using or electricity. Uh, but in this instance, since the building uh, is you know it's not built yet uh, we have no way of calibrating the model it's expected to be built at the end of next year so uh, stay tuned for more uh, shoot me an email and uh, in a year or so we can we can let you know uh, how the building is operating okay and, and to that point we will share everyone's contact information uh, so you can follow up on this uh, project and, and see how it goes okay so now we have one more question that's uh, sort of for the both of you um, for the Sage glass control and GSHP integration control, was there a backup system installed? And then we have a, the follow-on is, uh, were there any sensors embedded in the glass that can effectively control the active solar heat gain control? Jordan, I can, I can answer the first part of the question. Uh, from my understanding, they're asking if there's a backup, uh, probably heating or cooling system. And, and no, there, there is a... The, the ground heat exchanger is connected to modular chillers, which is connected to fan coils. And um, when 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 clients ask us, you know, if 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 we want to install a backup system to a ground heat exchanger, we ask them if they would install a backup system to their boiler. Uh, same sort of thing. If you're confident with your heating and cooling system, uh, then there's no need for uh, for for a backup there. Uh, so no, there there was no uh, heating or cooling backup. Um, yeah. But that that doesn't mean that there was an extra capacity built into the the the, the chiller, uh, but there wasn't a, a backup uh, uh, heating or cooling system. So Jordan, I'll pass it to you to talk about the uh, daylighting controls and the, the sensors. Yeah. So what what SageGlass delivers 100% of the time is an automated system that's governed by its own sort of proprietary software and logic, which is informed by real-time weather in the form of sensor reading. So a rooftop sky sensor, as well as facade mounted uh, lux sensors. Those essentially govern the behavior of the glass 24 seven, 365. The exception, and the exception in this case is um, by connecting to the VAS system, essentially that, that automated, typical automated logic that we would employ, which is, is largely about sort of managing comfort in, in the form of daylight and glare, can be overridden in times when it has to be to optimize performance of the geothermal heat pump system. So there will only be certain times when that needs to happen, but the BAS system can override essentially our kind of native logic um, at times when it needs to. I, I mean, Connor, you can comment on this if, if need be. I don't think that's going to be happening like the majority of the time, it's really just in, in those times when it's particularly important to to manage those those loads. Otherwise, our sort of native logic will will be governing. Yep. No, I'd agree with that. Okay, uh, Jordan. A couple of other questions. I'm going to combine them together. Um, do you have uh, have you done any projects uh, with triple pane uh, glass units for, for this? And um, can you give us an estimate on the, the cost per square meter and also technical size limits? Um, is there a limitation on the size of the uh, glass units? Yeah, so um, yes, we do triple panes all the time. Uh, most of our net zero and passive projects, including some of the ones I, I talked about were, were triple pane. A lot of our project volume overall is in Europe and, and much of Europe is, I mean, that's the, the norm. Uh, so no, no issue doing that. And that gives the added benefit of the significantly improved U value, right? Because our dynamic tinting improves uh, the SHGC, it does not impact the U value. So we would improve U value the same way a traditional window uh, manufacturer would. Um, Cost, I'll sort of give it in, in, in square feet, just most conversant, although it's you know, roughly a kind of 10 to one. You, you can think of it like roughly $600 um, per square meter. Um, that's for the glass, the controls, all the design and software support we're commissioning. All of that is sort of um, bundled in there. So you know what I tell people is you can't compare it to the price of regular glass. It's like comparing a flip phone to a smartphone, right? They're simply not comparable solutions. But if you look at, our price compared to glass plus shades plus any other kind of uh, solar heat 
gain solution, whether that's vertical fins, overhangs, or, or some kind of mechanized shade or louver system, we're probably cost competitive, we're definitely cost competitive, maybe even cost neutral from, from day one. So it's really about the solution sets uh, you're comparing. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're, we have to cut off the questions here. Um, we are going to go over to uh, Graham Coote uh, to present on the wastewater heat recovery system. Um, Graham, it's over to you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Adam, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks again for taking the time to attend today. Um, my name is Graham Coote, for those who weren't here for the beginning. Uh, name's Graham Coote. I'm a sales engineer at uh, HTS Engineering, uh, one of the largest independent HVAC equipment suppliers in North America. Um, I also have uh, Jody Guthrie and Brock Trimble here with me from Shark Energy Systems. They'll be joining a little bit later just to help uh, uh, field questions at the end. Um, so over the past decade or so, uh, HTS has really been focused on you know, creating strategic partnerships with manufacturers whose products we believe um, are going to help lead the shift to a more sustainable future in HVAC. So today I'm here to show you a unique technology from one such manufacturer. Uh, this is a product that uh, recovers energy stored in wastewater and uses this energy for something beneficial. So the manufacturer, Shark Energy Systems, uh, based out of British Columbia, um, has been perfecting this technology for over 10 years now and has some pretty uh, impressive installations around North America. So a quick overview of, of what I plan on talking about today. Um, first, we're going to look at you know, Shark's two main product lines, uh, the Shark and the Piranha. We're going to understand the major system components of each and, and how each works. Um, we're then going to look at uh, the reliability of waste wastewater as a source and compare this to, to other heat pump technologies that are readily available in Ontario and throughout North America. Um, we'll go through an actual theoretical sizing example uh, and review the estimated uh, GHG reduction um, uh, compared to a natural gas plant and compare the operational costs to other um, comparable technologies. After briefly touching on some maintenance considerations and uh, some frequently asked questions, um, we're going to review uh, a few actual case studies where the shark or the piranha has been installed. Um, so domestic hot water is really one of the last applications in our buildings that hasn't seen widespread energy recovery applied to it. Um, codes now require that, you know, in many cases, we have energy recovery on ventilation systems in buildings. Um, you know, chilled water plants often in Ontario have a means of, of achieving some kind of free cooling during the wintertime. Yet, we expend so much energy heating domestic cold water at 40 degrees Fahrenheit up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. We use it for seconds and we dump it down the drain. So the average temperature of wastewater leaving uh, a residential building is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 70 degrees F, there's a lot of energy that can be extracted, and it's actually perfect for a heat pump application. So the principle is pretty simple. Schematic on the left kind of shows our status quo. Um, we take city water at around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, we heat it up to a storage temperature of around 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and we do this primarily um, in Ontario with, with uh, natural gas. We inject some domestic cold water um, into, uh, um, into our distribution. So we supply uh, a temperature of you know, no more than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We use this water and we dump it down the drain. So the schematic on the right kind of shows you know, what we're here talking about today. So before we completely dump it down the drain and, and have our water end up going to wastewater energy recovery or wastewater treatment plants. Um, we intercept it with a wastewater holding tank. And we take this wastewater and we pump it into our packaged wastewater uh, uh, heat recovery device. Um, here, our, our heat pump kind of extracts or sucks the energy out of our wastewater and it injects it into a, you know, a high temperature usable hot water and we can get temperatures up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we then use this to preheat the incoming domestic cold water, providing some or in some cases all of the best domestic hot water required by the building. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, there are two product lines, um, the Piranha and the Shark. 
So the piranha is designed for smaller flow rates. So think, you know, individual small to medium multifamily residential buildings or residences. And the shark is primarily used for applications with higher flow rates and higher loads. So you can think, you know, district, district energy systems, um, water treatment plants. Um, we've even, you know, considered using this for a, a low carbon solution um, for, you know, balancing uh, an unbalanced geothermal field, which we talked about actually a, a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, we have lots of these in Ontario uh, because of our heating dominant climate. Um, target applications are really any building, any complex or any site uh, that has a large consistent uh, source of wastewater. Um, the more, typically the more domestic hot water being used by the building, the higher our wastewater temperature is going to be. And the more, you know, the more energy we can extract for beneficial use in, in heating applications. So the target applications shown here um, are by no means an exhaustive list. So HTS and, and Shark can help evaluate any application to, to determine if it would be a, a good fit for wastewater energy recovery. Okay, so I wanted to start with the piranha and kind of show you a, um, you know, a schematic of what the system looks like and dig down further to, to understand exactly how it works. Um, so the system itself is comprised of three major components. We have our piranha packaged heat pump, we have our wastewater holding tank, and we have our domestic hot water preheat tank. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, wastewater is captured in our holding tank. It's pumped to our piranha, or our piranha, um, the heat, uh, acting as a heat pump, it sucks the energy out of our wastewater and injects it to our high temperature loop, which preheats our domestic cold water supply. Um, where it's, you know, generates some or all of the domestic hot water for our building. Now the prana itself, which is shown up here, again, it's a packaged heat pump. Um, it's designed to handle solids that we'll typically find in, in our wastewater. So we have a four inch wastewater inlet, a six inch wastewater overflow to make sure that, you know, anything, any solids that get in aren't gonna become stuck and can actually get out. So this cycle kind of repeats itself um, as wastewater is available and the demand for hot water exists. So the piranha showed on the previous slide is a standard heating only heat pump. Um, another model is available that includes the ability to simultaneously heat and cool when a cooling source exists. So if you look at the schematic here, um, the difference is we have you know, some sort of cooling loop here. Um, this could be chill wa chilled water loop, this could be a condenser loop, something that requires heat to be pulled out um, in order to provide cooling to a building. So imagine this was you know, a, a building chilled water loop and normally we'd have a chiller which is um, providing chilled water to this building. If we have our heat recovery piranha, rather than taking wastewater um, and, and using that to, to recover energy and inject it into our heating loop, we can actually take uh, the heat from this chilled water loop and use that to inject into our hot water loop. Effectively, what we're doing is providing usable cooling to the building and providing usable, usable heating. So we get much higher COPs. Um, this is where you know, our, our energy savings uh, are gonna be by far the greatest. So for larger systems requiring higher flows and loads, we're typically gonna use the shark instead of the piranha. Um, so the shark difference differs from the piranha in that it's not an all-in-one package heat pump. Um, it's best to think of the shark as kind of a packaged wastewater filtration system, which can be paired with an external heat pump. So if you look at the example here, the setup really is similar to the to the piranha. Um, we have a wastewater uh, holding tank, we have our external heat pump, and we have our preheat st storage tank. Um, so the shark, you know, the package really includes a, a macerator and, and a filter, and this is so that um, any solids that are present in the wastewater are essentially ground up and then filtered out. The heat exchanger we use with the shark is, is different from the one we use with the piranha. Um, this heat exchanger requires, you know, very fine uh, filtered uh, wastewater in order to avoid plugging up plates, uh, which is why we include the macerator and, and the filter on the shark. So as filtered wastewater is passed through the primary side of this heat exchanger, the heat is exchanged to the secondary side. And that's where our heat pump essentially uh, absorbs the heat from our wastewater. And then again, similar to the way the piranha works, um, it'll inject that heat into a usable hot water loop. 
Okay, so, so far we've talked about using the energy stored in wastewater for domestic hot water preheat. Um, wastewater with, with temperatures ranging from 50 degrees F to 70 to degrees F is actually ideal for heating or cooling applications when using heat pumps. <clears throat> so the shark really just provides uh, filtered water to an external heat pump. So there's no reason why we can't pair this with applications that require heating, cooling, or both. And this is similar to the way you know we use source water uh, from, a, from a geothermal system. So the example here shows our, our shark tied to some kind of building condenser loop. Um, so essentially what we're doing is providing uh, a heat source or a heat sink or heat pumps that require you know, generation of domestic hot water, generation of building hot water or uh, uh, chilled water um, for a, a, some kind of building application. Um, if we don't have enough heat rejection uh, or heat absorption capabilities from our wastewater, we can pair this with other sources of, of uh, you know, heat sink or heat sources like a geothermal field, like a, a solar thermal system, or, or even a cooling tower. Okay, so if, if this technology um, is intended to be used all year round, I think it's important to understand how stable and reliable wastewater is as a source. If the temperature of wastewater would have varied drastically over the year, uh, kind of the same way that our outdoor air temperature does, um, we might run into problems getting the capacity or efficiency required uh, from our equipment during you know, the peaks of summer and the depths of winter. So you can see from this annual wastewater uh, temperature trend from the local wastewater treatment plant, um, the wastewater temperature doesn't really fluctuate much. We'll see lows in the winter time of maybe just over 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the summertime, we'll see highs of maybe just over 60 degrees. Uh, it's also important to, to point out that this is the temperature at the kind of the influent of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's reasonable to assume that, you know, from the point at which wastewater is generated, which is that building, um, to the, the wastewater treatment plant, there's gonna be a lot of energy loss as it traverses the, I guess, the piping network. Um, it's not unreasonable to assume that, you know, our wastewater temperature is going to be even higher uh, as it leaves the building before traveling through the network. So we should also com compare this with other sustainable sources of domestic hot water generation. Um, so two other kind of green alternative technologies uh, that are used to produce uh, domestic hot water are air source heat pumps and, and water source heat pumps uh, with a geothermal loop. So the trend in red you can see is, is the air source, uh, sorry, the, the temperature of the, of the, um, the outdoor air. Uh, it's pretty easy to predict. We have lows of, you know, just below freezing and average highs of maybe around 75 Fahrenheit and uh, peak highs of around 90 or above. Um, the geothermal inlet and outlet temperatures, yellow and blue, are a bit harder to predict. Uh, there are going to be many factors which determine um, the minimum and maximum temperatures of a field. However, when, when designing water source heat pumps, it's not uncommon to see minimum expected minimum entering temperatures from a geothermal field of maybe 35 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit and maximum temperatures of 70 or 80 Fahrenheit. So you can see compared to these other trends, you know, our wastewater um, temperature trend is fairly stable uh, by comparison. So I want to go through a practical example to show what kind of system uh, we'd see for a building like a, a 200 occupant student residence and, and what kind of performance we can expect. So let's imagine a building with 10 stories, uh, 200 residents, and you know every two residents share a common washroom. So essentially we have 100, um, 100 private washrooms. In order to incorporate uh, a wastewater energy recovery system into this building, we need to make sure we have space for a wastewater storage tank. And this can be installed below grade, at grade, or, or above grade, even above the location of the piranha. Um, a domestic hot water preheat tank and a piranha uh, packaged heat pump. So our optimization program um, aims to have, you know, the system take as much of the domestic hot water load as possible. So here in this building, you can see from the table, it's actually possible to achieve 100% or nearly 100% of the domestic hot water generation in this building. In order to do this, we need to make sure we have a sufficient volume of wastewater available at all times. 
and a sufficient volume of domestic hot water buffer. And this prevents us from you know, needing to drastically oversize our piranha. So the wastewater storage tank acts, uh, acts almost like a, like a battery. Um, we need to make sure we have energy stored here at all times in the event that you know, we don't have um, a continuous wastewater flow, but we still have the need for domestic hot water. So here, the, if we want to achieve 100% of our building's heating, uh, you see that we need you know, a recommended wastewater storage tank of around 4,250 gallons and a recommended domestic hot water storage of around 1,100 gallons. We don't necessarily have to, to go with these sizes. We can go with a smaller size. It just means that we may not be able to achieve 100% of our, of our heating um, with our wastewater energy recovery system. You can see the affected or the, the uh, estimated uh, GHG reductions though, and they're fairly drastic for a 200 occupant building. Um, if, we, if we go with a system like this, we can expect to achieve you know, just over 80, um, 80 tons of, of uh, uh, CO2 equivalent uh, reductions per year compared with an 85% efficient for the plant. It's also important to compare the piranha's performance with other green alternative sources. Um, so, you know, we, by doing this, we can also compare, you know, how much electricity we, we expect to pay uh, for different types of systems. <clears throat> so the Piranha uh, energy recovery system that we selected in the previous example is shown here. So um, with an average annual COP of around three and a half, which is pretty realistic given uh, for, for, for a residential building like this, we can expect to pay just over $18,000 a year uh, in, uh, in, in electrical utility costs. And this is based on you know, an average rate of 17 cents a kilowatt hour. We compare this with an electric water heater, which has about 100% efficiency or a COP of one, we're gonna be paying a far higher uh, electric utility bill at the end of each month. We look at a standard air source heat pump and an air source heat pump COP is gonna vary pretty drastically throughout the year. Um, a good, you know, a, a good estimation of the annualized COP in Ontario is around 2.4. Uh, at this COP, we're still going to be paying a higher electricity cost uh, at the end of each month uh, compared to our wastewater energy recovery system. There are other technologies I didn't really mention here. Um, CO2 heat pumps, uh, air source CO2 heat pumps are starting to, to, to become more popular in North America. Uh, we can expect you know, a very similar COP by using a, a, an air source CO2 heat pump. However, right now, the capital costs of CO2 heat pumps are still very high. Um, you'll probably be paying more for, a, for a, an air source CO2 heat pump system than a wastewater energy recovery system. This may change in, in, in the years as, as this becomes you know, more and more adopted in North America, but this is kind of status quo right now. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to touch on uh, maintenance and, uh, and some commonly asked questions. So for smaller installations, um, the maintenance frequency is carried out semi-annually. For larger installations involving the shark, this is usually um, this is usually done quarterly. The tasks are very similar to what would be carry out, carried out in a typical heat pump system. Um, there's some additional cleaning required. You know, strainers need to be cleaned a little more deeply and the plate and frame heat exchanger in the shark package needs to be flushed in place. It's nothing too onerous. Um, the system's completely sealed. So when it's operating, it doesn't smell uh, unless there's a, some kind of leak, which, which we haven't heard of yet. Um, there's no risk of methane gas filling the mechanical room. There are vents that are attached to the, to the piranha and to the wastewater holding tank, but these are typically vented outdoors where they're not gonna fill you know, any mechanical room or occupied space. So very quickly, before we take some questions, um, I wanted to go over three case studies of, of projects that uh, Shark Energy has installed. So the first one is the Wall Center, uh, which is a large, a large development in downtown Vancouver. Um, so there's you know, phase one incorporated a large shark unit, phase two incorporated two Piranha T10 heat, heat pumps. So we have these two heat pumps, we have two preheat holding tanks and the wastewater holding tank. And all of these are incorporated into, they built in a new room in a parking garage, and it takes up the equivalent of only four, uh, four par parking spaces. So we know the space requirements are, are not too onerous. Um, GHG reduction 
they're seeing a, a GHG reduction of around 116 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. It performs at a consistent 5.0 COP and it helped the building achieve the goal. The next one is the 735 building uh, in Vancouver. And this was the, uh, the site of Shark's um, Electrical Power Research in Institute challenge in 2020. Uh, this was actually sponsored by five of the largest utility providers in the US. So the system here provides nearly 100% of the domestic hot water production for the site. Uh, consists of one around a T10 heat recovery uh, heat pump, four domestic hot water um, pre-heat storage tanks, and actually has two original natural gas boilers that, that are in place from the original building design to kind of take over um, if they need a bit of redundancy. Uh, runs in an average COP of 3.8 and just uh, we're seeing emission savings of just under 50 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. The last one I wanted to touch on is uh, a large installation done in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a 150,000 square foot administration building at, at, DC, at the D.C. water site. Uh, they use you know, one single Shark 660 to provide filtered <clears throat> source water to heating and cooling equipment serving the building. So a small amount of this is, is used to produce domestic hot water. However, the majority is used to uh, provide heat pumps uh, that are providing cooling for the building. Um, this is you know, used in lieu of cooling towers. So they expect that you know, on the heating side, they're saving about 12 and a half tons of CO2 equivalent per year. On the cooling side, they're actually, they've estimated they're saving about 1.5 million gallons of water that would have traditionally been lost uh, from evaporation and flow down. So that's, uh, that's all I have for now. Adam, I think we have uh, a few minutes uh, to answer questions. So I'll invite um, Jody and, and Brock uh, to unmute themselves as well. And if you, if you two wanna turn on your camera as well, um, we can field some questions. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, and uh, welcome uh, Brock and Jody from uh, Shark. Um, Welcome to the webinar. So we do have a few questions. Um, and again, uh, to all our attendees, if you have a question, uh, please uh, type it into the chat and I will read it out. So question number one, um, is there a calculator uh, that can show us uh, how to size the shark or piranha systems? Yeah, so I, yes. I can say, sorry, go ahead, Brock. No, go ahead, Graham. I, I was going to say there, there is a calculator that, that can show how to size these systems. Brock, I don't know if this is if this is in the public realm right now, we usually, we typically take input from, um, you know, potential applications and and uh, use our calculator. To, there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of factors that go into this. There can be a lot of different scenarios. So we usually provide, you know, this, uh, I guess, this, um, this output from the calculator that we have. Correct. Yeah, uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, publicly available. Uh, we do encourage everyone to uh, to be directed towards our team at HTS uh, or any of our local uh, representatives across North America um, who will assist with the selection process uh, and be able to provide you the printout uh, from the selection tool. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's common with these complex engineering systems where, um, you know, uh, it, we often have to submit things and ask you to do a little bit of modeling for us. That makes sense. Um, okay, question number two. Uh, Graham, uh, you were comparing the performance of the, the shark and piranha systems with an air source heat pump. Would uh, it be more appropriate to compare uh, with a water-to-water -water heat pump? Yeah, and I, to be honest, I thought about doing that as well. Um, the reason I chose an air source heat pump is this is one of the technologies that we are seeing uh, being used for domestic hot water. That being said, we are seeing water source heat pumps used, especially when, when they're paired with a, um, you know, it, a, a geothermal system serving the building. Um, we have done that comparison. It depends on how, how the geothermal system operates throughout the year and what the temperatures are. Really, when you're comparing the two, it comes down to the, the average COP that you're going to be operating throughout the year. I haven't seen, or at least I haven't seen it often, uh, uh, water source heat pumps that are going to be operating at a, a consistent average COP of 3.5 when tied to a geothermal field. 
because you would need, you know, temperatures, I guess, uh, source temperatures of 70 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, which we typically don't see year round with a, with a geothermal field. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, we have no more questions coming in, but I'm gonna give a, another minute for anyone who has any, any questions and ask a question myself. Um, I've seen uh, in, in my work with solar energy, the solar thermal is being used to, to charge uh, geothermal fields um, in places where there's sort of an imbalance when there's uh, you know, too much heating um, demand. So they can use solar uh, thermal to recharge the geofield. Has this been used, uh, the shark or piranha system been used in a similar capacity at all? I guess I'll turn it over to Brock or, or Jody to see if we have any of those in solar. Sure. Sorry, um, um, Adam, to confirm, using the wastewater energy source to essentially charge a, a geofield. Yes. Is that the question? Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, yeah, we have a number of projects that are currently in design for that process. Uh, the nice thing with wastewater is that we're able to effectively stabilize uh, a geofield in both directions. So if there's a case where the geofield is either being uh, overdrawn and cooling, we can uh, take energy from wastewater and recharge the, the geofield with this. However, on the flip side, if the geofield is being uh, oversaturated with energy, we can also reject energy into the wastewater. So keeping uh, the field itself really stable throughout that lifespan, um, very similar to what uh, Connor had been showing um, previously with his, you know, his extended lifespan uh stabilization temperature uh graph there yeah it's a, i mean the, that that's what one benefit it does have over sol solar thermal where solar thermal can only charge you know waste wastewater is a is a is a battery similar to similar to what uh what you saw for for the uh, geothermal field you can inject energy in or you can take energy out mm -hmm. yeah they're a great collaboration yeah, Adam, yeah. this is uh, this is Connor here. I actually got a question for you guys here. I'll flip on my camera. Yeah, I, I'm I'm agreeing with you guys with what you guys are saying for sure. Um, but I had a question in regards to comparing your shark system with uh, we we published a paper a couple of years back on a similar technology, but it was an in pipe uh, heat exchanger. So uh, it circulates heat exchange fluid uh, inside of the concrete sewage pipe or wastewater mm -hmm. pipe. So I, I was wondering, have you guys done a life cycle cost analysis comparing those two types of technologies or are there any sort of comparisons or in general, what are your thoughts on the difference between the shark and uh, that, that sort of wastewater uh, heat exchanger uh, technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So the the in pipe uh, wastewater energy transfer, um, there's a couple of issues. One, the, the piping is in uh, the bottom portion of the pipe. Uh, so this requires that there is always wastewater flow uh, throughout that pipe in order to be effective. With our system, uh, because we have that wastewater holding tank, we essentially have that battery that it's able to operate uh, throughout the day, throughout the year, during periods of low or no flow. So we always have that wastewater source available, uh, again, either energy draw or energy rejection. The other thing that we've seen uh, with the in-pipe style of system is that because it's on the, the bottom of the pipe, there is the potential for sludge buildup, uh, and that actually degrades the ability to transfer energy. It basically creates an insulating blanket uh, that requires more uh, maintenance and service in order to have that system be effective. Um, so with those two items in mind, uh, that's how they kind of differ from how the shark uh, system operates on a much larger scale. Right, okay. Yeah, the, the specific one we looked at was a helical uh, pipe. Uh, so it wasn't just on the bottom, uh, mm, but it, okay. was, it was around. So does that change anything or? Uh, I assume that, that you would be looking at probably a vertical pipe then, correct? No, it was horizontal, but it, it, it uh, you know, it was a helical HDP or, or plastic pipe embedded within the concrete wall and it spiraled around. There are those ones that are at the bottom, mm -hmm. like a wrap therm, um, yep. but those ones that, that we looked at uh, specifically, it's called the source energy pipe. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was it was a helix uh, within the concrete wall. I was just wondering if that changes anything. Sure. Uh, the only thing, and sorry, I, I made the assumption on wrap therm. I didn't want to specifically call out uh, any other <laughs> 
spacers. Um, yeah, the only problem with the helical then is that it, it really has to be in a, a pressurized sort of a force main yeah. style of, uh, of wastewater, or wastewater piping. Um, right. Again, uh, very minor issues kind of throughout that, uh, but it always has to be charged and, and pressurized and flowing. Okay, interesting. Yeah, th thanks guys, appreciate it. The other yeah, the other component when they look at a, a large scale grid application like that, it doesn't allow it then to come into an urban setting where they can apply it to say a microgrid or a few buildings or an individual buildings with the efficiencies that we see with the shark system. Right. Yeah, I guess it gets complicated if you know you're you're building a development. How do you split that up? Uh, you know, in terms of who gets the heat, that sort of thing. Yes. So, great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great presentation, Connor. Okay, so we have one more question that came in uh, from the audience, and then uh, it'll be time for us to wrap up. Um, we're over time a little bit. Hopefully, everyone can stay in a couple more minutes. Um, so, a question from Sandra: As a prospective air source heat pump homeowner, I have been discouraged by the lack of technical experience and confidence for servicing the units. Um, so, what uh, I suppose what do what does Shark provide? Um, for heating and cooling training uh, for servicing these units. Presumably they will have a long life and they, there are obviously some serviceable, serviceable parts in there. Hmm. Yeah, we uh, at Shark have a, a program that we call Shark Smart. Uh, we train all of our field technicians uh, on how to service the equipment, how to uh, work with the controls uh, and really provide the, the care for the equipment for the lifespan. Um, this again would primarily be through the HTS team or any of their, uh, or, or sorry, any of our, our North American representatives uh, and their associated tech firms. Um, but there is uh, very stringent training. Anyone who works on the shark system uh, is trained and certified by shark uh, to provide it with the, uh, the care it needs. Great, thank you. Uh, so that, with that, we're going to have to uh, wrap up here. Uh, I'm just trying to put my screen back on. Um, uh, odd, it won't let me share my screen again. So, <laughs> there, hang on, uh, let me, there we go. There, go. Uh -huh. there we can show my screen now. Okay, there. Uh, just thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to our presenters. Um, that was uh, incredibly good information um, on, on all those topics. Um, thank you to everyone who asked a question and everyone who attended. We really appreciate uh, you coming along to these webinars and learning everything we can about these uh, sustainable technologies um, and ways to make our built environment more sustainable. Um, so I want to uh, show you again our next event here there you can follow that link uh, in the middle and again for anyone who missed it at the top uh, the link is case sensitive so capitals sbc pk product knowledge uh, and then m for me but then the a y or lowercase um, click there or uh, type that into your uh, url bar and um, we will see you hopefully at our next series um, which is uh, covering the Mitsubishi uh, air to water heat pumps and the Matrix solar uh, BIPV systems. Uh, so thank you again to everyone. Uh, and with that, we'll close and uh, we look forward to seeing you in May. Goodbye. <laughs>